Hi divers, Alec Pierce from Scuba 2000 with another vintage scuba episode for you to enjoy. I hope you'll enjoy this. In fact, I know you'll enjoy this one. This is about regulators. I mentioned earlier, I have lots of regulators. I have no idea how many, probably 200 uh, double hose regulators and um, I don't know how many, single hose, 500. And they're all old, all old, older than 1975. That's what vintage means. In fact, most of mine have come from the 50s and 60s. Uh, uh, but anyway, I'm gonna share this with you. I know that the, the vintage divers out there, the vintage collectors and vintage divers will enjoy this. Uh, lots of neat stuff to look at. So this is two hose regulators, okay? And as I said in the title, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Because they were good, and they were bad. And some are ugly. <laughs> but anyway, let's talk about it, okay? First of all, let me just show you a few, and, and maybe you'll understand why there's such a, so much nostalgia and interest in old two-hose regulars. First of all, they were neat. They were really, really neat. I owned a 1956 Buick. Special. It was special, all right? Big, beautiful, heavy, great big chrome bumpers and thick seat. Oh, it's a fantastic car. I'd love to buy one today. Can't afford it. But they were just beautiful. And it's a little bit the same with two hose regulators. A lot of the older divers were raised on two hose regs. I was trained, did my first dives on two hose regulators, so they're special in that way. Also, they were really nice. I mean, single hose modern regulators are safe, very, very efficient, easy, easy breathing, low maintenance, lifetime guarantees, all those things. They're, they're, they're great, like modern cars. But they didn't have much sex appeal. They certainly had no nostalgic appeal. They weren't beautiful. You can't look at a modern regular and say it's beautiful. Here, let me show you what I mean. Look here. Let's pick, let's pick this one right here. This is a, a, a Nimrod. The other thing about the old two-hose right? they had names. Yeah, they had names, not numbers. Now when you buy a new reg, you get the XWT200F. That's what you buy. Back in the old days, they had names. They were fantastic. So this one is called the Snark. This is the third edition, so it's the Snark 3, made by Nimrod, very popular company uh, in, in the 60s and 70s. Actually, they're made in Spain, but they were very popular in North America. And look at this regular. First of all, it weighs about five pounds. You don't want this today because you're traveling, right? You don't want it heavy, but back in those days, it was great. You pick, oh, wow, what a beautiful regular, nice, shiny chrome, brass badge, painted blue, riveted to the outside case. Look on the back. Look at the back. They didn't just have a plain chrome case. The whole thing was engraved. Beautiful starburst on the back. And, oh, just, they were gorgeous, beautifully made. Now, this one's in perfect condition. This is like new. And Nemrod was a very special regulator where the regulator hoses, the two hose reg hoses, had clamps, like the hose clamp on them. Uh, so did Nemrod. But look at Nemrod, what they did, they made a beautiful little custom rubber cover to go over the hose clamp. So the whole thing was just a gorgeous regulator. I mean, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say they're reputable. Here's another example. This is an American uh, regulator made by Waterlung down in California, Sportsways. This is called the Waterlung. Again, it has a name. This is called the Hydro -tin Twin. Hydro Twin. That's the name of it. It had a name. Again, beautiful. Beautifully chrome uh, case and uh, two hoses and everything else. This particular one is special to me because it is signed by Sam Lecoq. Sam McCook was the founder of, um, of uh, Sportsways, a company, a very popular uh, company in the 60s and even into the 70s, a very good friend of mine, and I had this regular at, at, at a, a vintage event, and he signed it for me. So regulators back in the old days were really, really interesting, really neat. Here's another one. Now, this is an interesting one. This is a North Hill, and it has a name. It's called the Air Lung. You notice, by the way, we have not used the word scuba yet. The scuba had not been invented. So this is not called scuba regulator. It's called the Air Lung. Beautiful regulator, extremely well made, all cast bronze. Look, bronze, cast bronze, held together with stainless steel screws. Has a built-in J-Bell reserve on it. Oh, just a beautiful regulator. And the, the mouthpiece, believe it or not, this mouthpiece, way ahead of its time, it actually had a Venturi assist. So you could twist the mouthpiece, when it was in your mouth, you could twist the mouthpiece, you see, it would turn, and it would make it easier to breathe, give you a little shot of air when you needed it. Just a beautiful regulator, also very expensive for the day. You could buy a nice regulator for about 30 bucks. That probably cost about 100, but it was a beautiful regulator. Again, things weren't as bad in the old days as you might think. Most regulators today are made of Cycolac, which is a fancy word for special plastic, very, very tough plastic. Well, there's a regulator from the 60s made of plastic. Actually made of Bakelite, but it's the same type of thing. So it wasn't uncommon. A very light, very popular regulator made by U.S. Divers, Aqualung, popular company. Yellow hoses. I don't know why they made them yellow. They didn't last very long, but it, just interesting. Now, here's one. Oh, boy. And again, you vintage divers, you're probably going to drool when you see this. This is what was called the Viking. 
It was made by a company, again, in the United States, in, in, uh, in the Midwest. Beautiful, beautiful regulator, completely different shape. Instead of the typical round shape, they made it in this kind of odd shape. In fact, it looks like and was called the beer can regulator. How about that? And several features on this had a low pressure outlet and a nice decal. You don't find these anywhere anymore. And you certainly don't find them with a beautiful, perfect decal. That's the original decal, too. Has a reserve on it, a little lever you could flip up and down to get extra air. Again, they put on yellow hoses and a standard mouthpiece. But isn't that beautiful? It's just beautiful. You don't get rigs like that today. A couple more quick examples I'll show you. Here's one from Decor. Decor was a big, big company back then. And they also made two hose regulators when they first started. This is from the 60s. They went into single hose regulators pretty quick, pretty quickly and for divers. And their single hose regulators were considered among the very, very best rugged, uh, environmentally protected, and good easy breathers. This is one of their earlier two hose regulators and just a beautiful regulator. And again, it, it, this has a name. It's called the uh, Clipper. And, and on, the, on the back, it also had another neat feature, which is you might think is a modern feature. But right here, I don't know if you can zoom in there, Kevin. Can you see that? Dial a breath. Well, what's that? Dial a breath. And it's easier or harder. There's a little button here. You can turn it. It's a Venturi Assist. So if you need it, if you're puffing and panting, you need a little shot of air, you flip that, and you get a little boost from it. This actually wasn't very popular. A couple of reasons. First of all, you couldn't reach it. <laughs> Behind your head, right? And uh, secondly, uh, it didn't work that well. But it was an attempt, anyway, uh, of the, some of those beautiful old regulators. So the two hose regulators at the time, from, well, from the beginning of scuba in the mid-40s, right up until about <clears throat> the mid to late 60s. They made them into the early 70s, but they were pretty much passe by then. It was a fantastic time to be a scuba diver, and we had that classic old two bubbly big uh, hoses over our heads that came down. We breathed. We were real frogmen. They were really nice. So I wanted to take a minute with you and talk about two more things. First of all, a couple of very special regulators, and then I also want to talk about uh, uh, some of the bad things about two hoses. They weren't perfect by any stretch. So first of all, let me explain to you that while these regulators, most of them are made in the United States, the very earliest regulators didn't come from the United States. They actually came from France. Now that shouldn't be surprising of you. The first regulators were invented. The first practical regulators were invented in France. And uh, so this is an example of an American brand, U.S. Divers Aqualung regulator. But if you look closely at the bottom, you'll see that this has a decal, a sticky decal that was put on there at the place of manufacture. Where was it made? Made in France. It's an interesting story that the very first regulators that we had here in North America for diving came from France. As a matter of fact, a gentleman by the name of René Bouzeau, René Bouzeau, you may probably never heard of him, he brought the first regulators into North America. Interestingly enough, he brought them into Canada, Montreal, and uh, opened up a market and was going to sell uh, regulators uh, uh, all across North America. He soon discovered that the market in Canada was kind of limited, so he fairly quickly moved to California, started U.S. divers, Aqualung, and the rest is history. It was very, very successful. But it's interesting that those first regulators came from France. Maybe it's not surprising to some of you who know the history of scuba diving. But there's a regulator that was made in France. I want to talk very briefly about two more things. First of all, uh, the very earliest regulators, they weren't like this. We couldn't get them like this. Uh, way, way back, and these were expensive. Some of these rates cost 30 or $40. That was a lot of money. That was a week's wages. So very early, back in the do-it-yourself days, the DIY days, you could pick up a magazine. Here's an example. Popular Science was, it was an example. This magazine is still being made. This is a 1953, July 1953 issue, and you can see a scuba diver on the front, and he's rigging a scuba unit. Well, oh, big deal. Ah, look right down here. I don't know if you can zoom in there. Build your own diving lung. Ah, that's not build your own scuba regulator. Again, scuba had not been invented. Build your own diving lung. What's that all about? You think they sold a few of these issues? I bet you, I bet you everybody under 25 bought one of these. Well, if you go to the issue inside, there it is. How to build and use a diving lung. My gosh, look at that. And you see the bits and pieces down here? You get a couple of tanks, and then you break the bits and pieces, and you make up a harness. Everybody made up their own harness. They were all different. And this step-by-step -step article in here, on, on what to get and how to take a U.S. Navy oxygen diluter valve. Because the U.S. Navy, in those days, they used oxygen for higher altitudes. And there was a special valve that they had built in uh, to the, uh, to, to the air, aircraft so that the pilot could, uh, could give himself oxygen when he needed it. It was called an oxygen diluter valve. And this article in here, believe it or not, actually tells you how to take one of those oxygen diluter valves and uh, turn it into a scuba regulator. Well, diving lung. 
Remember, no scuba. And uh, a lot of people did that. Oh, it was very popular. First of all, the oxygen diluter valves, here's one. I happen to have one. I have a lot of stuff. This is an actual U.S. Navy oxygen diluter valve from a World War II aircraft. Okay, fastened right on the wall beside the pilot, and he would reach down and turn it as you needed to get oxygen, you see? Well, if you could get one of these, there were surplus stores, and these were cheap, 10 bucks. And then maybe not even that. There used to be boxes of them. Get one of these, and then you pick up a couple of tanks. Take a look over here, Kev. These are a couple of tanks. Now, these are a couple of air tanks, compressed air tanks, like your scuba tank. But they weren't for scuba. This is also from the U.S. Navy. And these compressed air tanks were used for a variety of things. They were used to uh, raise and lower the landing gear, open and close the bomb bay doors, and so on. You see? And uh, so if you could get a set of tanks like this, they were cheap too, probably five, six bucks a piece. And you could pick up some plumbing fittings. I mean, literally, these are almost plumbing fittings made of brass, fasten them together, follow the instructions in the book, right? Okay? Get your oxygen diluter valve, modify it, get a gas mask hose, a gas mask hose, exactly right, and there you go. So look, see, there, there you go. there's a modified, this is a different model, but there, this is a scuba, this is a scuba system. This is a diving lung for diving. Some fellow, this is not mine, I actually got all these parts together, followed the instructions in popular science, modified the oxygen diluter valve, got the gas, and went scuba diving. I have about five or six of these homemade scuba units, just like they're very popular. You can see it's exactly the same unit, modified a little bit. Gas mask, hose, couple of tanks, and one scuba dive. And you can see here that he's made of a, a, a set of harnesses and on the back, a couple of pieces of webbing, and he actually welded up. This guy was pretty handy. He could weld, and he welded up a set of uh, harnesses here so he could put this tank on his back, and, and he went scuba diving just like that. So that's pretty interesting, uh, I think, anyway, and I'm really, really pleased. I did not have my own homemade diving lung. I started diving in 58, and by 1958, uh, we, we had, uh, prop, you could go and buy, there weren't cheap uh, tanks and regulators and so on. What about the ugly? I mean, this stuff was really exciting. What about the ugly? Well, two of those regulators were, were not great. People today will sometimes say to me, because well, I run a vintage double hose scuba course. It's a PADI certification program that I designed, and I actually take divers. We talk about, about two hose regulators, double hose regulators, and then we actually go to the pool. I go scuba diving with double hose regulators, and uh, that's one evening class. And then we go to open water. That's right, we actually go to open water. I have scuba regulators, old ones like this, and, and uh, with limitations, they are completely safe, work perfectly, and we go scuba diving. She is kind of neat to see a class of students, six or seven students in the water using two hose regulators a lot, and they really enjoy it, and you get certified too. So, but sometimes they ask me after, my gosh, how did you ever breathe with those things? These are things that are impossible to breathe. They're hard to get air. And, hey, listen. We didn't know that. There was nothing better. So in the old days, when we made a homemade one and sucked on it and got air, hey, we were ecstatic. If we got a brand new fancy one and we sucked on it and got air even more easily, wow. Now compared to today's regulators, you know, with balanced first stages and balanced venturi systems and so on, you know, they were terrible. They really were. <laughs> but they worked. And we were so excited to be scuba divers. We were going to be frogmen. So they weren't easy to breathe. They also were not easy to maintain. First of all, the hoses were very, very brittle. I have a lot of good hoses here, but a lot of my hoses on the old regulars are very dry. They used to dry out. And the hoses in those days were expensive. They were $7 each. Well, that's a lot of money. They only last for maybe three or four years unless you were very careful with them. You can buy new hoses today for about 30 or 40 about dollars a piece and, uh, and so on. But they were high maintenance and they weren't terribly, terribly reliable. But more than a few of them that, uh, that uh, didn't uh, work as well as they should have. Also, when you were using them, it was kind of funny too, because you'll notice on these regulators that they don't have any purge button on the, on the, on the mouthpiece. There's no purge button there. Just air comes in, air goes out. Air in, air out, just like that. So how do you suppose it came out of your mouth? Which it would do, you know, just as today. It would come out of your mouth, and the hoses would fill with water. Hold on a minute, that's a lot of water. Well, these, early, these later models, the later models had non-return valves built into the mouthpiece here. Valves that would only let wouldn't let water into the mouthpiece. So to clear them, you would simply blow. You would put it back in your mouth. If it came out, put it back in your mouth. So if it came out of your mouth, you had to be sure you had some water left. There's some air, sorry, air left in your lungs. You could blow them clear. That's what you had to do. If you were out of air completely, then you could, in fact, lay on your back and hold the regulator up, and sometimes it would blow air out and clear on its own. Uh, but uh, normally we would just blow them out. And it wasn't too bad. The very, very earliest two-hose regulators like this one, they were different. 
I don't know if you can see the difference, but there's a difference here. This is a very similar unit, a very similar regulator, but there is one difference about this. Watch. Air in, air out. But look, there's no clamps. This particular mouthpiece is very, very rare, very, very old. This is a one-piece hose. So this is a two-hose regulator. There's really only one hose. <laughs> Bit of a joke. You see, it's a one-piece hose. Not like the later models where there was an intake hose, an exhaust hose, clamped to a non-return mouthpiece. This one had one long hose. Now, if this came out of your mouth, it was a different story. It wasn't quite so easy to clear this one because how much water would those hoses hold? What do you think, Kevin? That's got to hold about a gallon, a half a gallon, a liter of water. So you had to now clear a liter of water. No purge button. You had to have big lungs. So with a rig like this, you would hold it up and hope that the air came out and they would blow the regulator clear. So you could get back back underwater. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> if you pick up an old uh, an old textbook, this is a very popular textbook on scuba diving. Uh, in those days, there weren't very many books. There was no paddy, so there wasn't a, a wealth of uh, of um, uh, textbooks and, and knowledge around. There's no Google. So <laughs> there weren't too many textbooks. This was probably the single most popular textbook for the first 30 to 40 years of scuba diving, a new science of skin and scuba diving. Uh, this, uh, by the way, is mine. Alex C. Pierce, Lindsay, Ontario. I'm from Lindsay, Ontario, and that is my rather childish signature when I was about 14, 15 years old. And in this textbook, they went through everything. When you learned, when you took a scuba diving course in the old days, boy, it was a course. My course is 26 weeks. Every Tuesday night for 26 weeks. Do the math, that's a half a year. My mom drove me to Peterborough summer and winter, until I uh, finished the scuba course. We learned everything. We learned about compressors and all kinds of stuff. But you'll notice in here just exactly what I was telling you, that when you take the, you see how it shows how the diver has to roll or hold the mouthpiece up above his head there. You see some of those pictures. So this was a big deal. Two-hose regulators required special skills or special methods to get them clear. And then again, we didn't have safe seconds. You know that today uh, you have a safe second of your buddy has a problem, runs out of air. Uh, you can give him your octopus or safe second. What did we do in the old days? We didn't have octopuses. We had to actually take the mouthpiece out of our mouth, hand it to our buddy. He had to clear it, right? All that water. Take a breath, couple of breaths, and give it back to me. I had to clear it. All that water. So it wasn't it wasn't much fun. So the rigs were great. They were beautiful. They were nostalgic, and they worked for us as young people getting started in scuba in the 50s and 60s. It was, it was exciting, really exciting. But mechanically and in practice, they were not at all like today. When I say that today's regulators are safe and effective and reliable and wonderful, I mean that sincerely. A lot of fun, a lot of nostalgia, beautiful, but they just weren't, just weren't perfect. Anyway, I hope that has... Um, has that been of some interest to you? Some of the interesting and unique old double host regulators. I will talk more about double host regulators in the future because I have so many. Some are very special. I might take one in particular, like the, the beer can or one of the other regulators, and talk about it alone and, uh, and give you some more information. And the homemade unit, that's got to be freaky. Eh? Would you do that today? Would you make your own scuba regular? Think about it. I'll get a few parts together in your mother's kitchen, a couple tools. Anyway, <laughs> it was a lot of fun back in the old days. So, Pinty Scuba. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you uh, learned a couple of neat things, and, uh, and uh, I hope that you'll write in some comments and some questions. Please do that. I love those comments and questions, and it helps me to plan for more episodes. Alec Pierce, Vintage Scuba. Thanks, guys.